Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us. And we have a great panel of people that's going to talk about the disabled Black perspective. And I thank you, the panel, for just giving us some of your time to just talk about your feelings and to share with so many people in the world. Because <laughs> we really, with this virtual stuff, we really can have the ability to talk to the entire world. And I'm Chuck, uh, I'm going to be the facilitator, I guess, to ask some questions and just kind of have an openness. So um, really what I want everybody to do is I'm going to call on your names and I want you to introduce yourselves to the room and just give me a quick overview of what you feel the disabled Black perspective it means to you. Okay. So um, who's going to be first? So I'm going to go with him. Imani, could you just start and share? And so be who you are. Of course. Hi, everyone. My name is Imani Barbarin. Um, I'm the person behind crutchesandspice.com, as well as I'm the communications director of Disability Rights Pennsylvania. Um, right now, in terms of disability and Blackness, it feels like a lot of erasure in a lot of different spaces all at once. Um, but I know that there's a lot of joy and hope within our community and a lot of, and a lot of just coming together and just relying on one another through this very traumatic time. Um, the Black disability community means everything to me. Um, and I'm grateful for them, but I wish we didn't have to use shared trauma to show just how resilient we are. Great. And next, I want to go with Lester Bennett. Hi, everyone. My name is Lester Bennett. Right now, um, I work with Casey Ball Supports Coordination. I am a um, the executive um, assistant to her, and we're a home and community-based uh, program um, service coordinating entity. Um, but right now, uh, as a black person with a, a disability, what it kind of means to me is just that you know we have something that um, we're able to have special powers. I, I, I feel like so as a person with a disability and black, it's like. You bring those two things together, it's like you're super powerful. So, like for me, it, it, it allows me to feel like um, we've been we've been brought here to do special things, and when we're out there shining, no one can tell us nothing. So it's like I, it's a community that is too special, and I'm glad to be here to help like push it forward. Thank you. Thanks, Lester, and Bree. Hi everyone, I'm Bri. Uh, I'm a podcaster and sound engineer. My show is called Power Not Pity and it's all about the lives and loves of disabled people of color. And I think right now um, being black and disabled is like Imani said, everything like Lester said, it's about superpowers. Um, I'm gonna say it's also about survival and it's just everything in the way that I move and the way that I like, you know, uh, go through the world. Um, I can't be anything but black and disabled and all the I other identities I bring. Great, great. And Kevin? Hello, I'm Kevin Mundy and I am a deaf interpreter. I wear many hats. And thank you for having me here and being involved tonight. I'm very excited to see the panelists. It's very nice. And I think it's very important to empower disabled people within the deaf community and to actually advocate and educate the other communities to learn more about the disabilities within our community. You know, we always advocate and it's so important to be included. And that means that we also can be included and work together and partner together. And that's what I look forward to in the future. Thank you. Jalel King, the King. Uh, this is kind of a weird question for me to be perfectly honest with you. Uh, mostly because I just feel like I've just lived my life um, and I'm, learning more about uh, community as a whole when it comes to people with disabilities because in a lot of, I, I do a lot of art. And so within that field, we don't really, I, well, I don't see nearly as many people represented 
with uh, disabilities as I think there probably should be, as well as there being an outlet for people with disabilities to have something more or less an outlet to display all and what they can do and what they are. So it's just an interesting dynamic for me to kind of be among other people who kind of share um, a lot of commonality in relations to uh, what we deal with in our everyday to struggle to basically have what we all want, which is a life and a life of love and, and greatness. Thank you. So thank you everyone for giving us a quick overview of who you, who you are and um, just your feelings. Let's just jump into it. And I guess I want to start a little bit hard. Uh, we've had a lot of things that's happened in our community um, recently and really not, not recently, but um, we had the death of George Floyd. And you know that that triggered a lot of things. And it was a lot of people who died before that. Um, I want to ask um, Imani, like, how did you feel before the death of George Floyd, and 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 the the things that has happened in the different communities, and uh, like you just your feelings of of people of color and within the disability community who have suffered at the hands of violence. So, how do you can you give us a quick how you felt? Yeah, I mean, um, I was born with my disability, and so I've been raised fairly well versed in what I need to do to hide my crutches, lessen mm -hmm. the blow on any sort of male family members who are with me. Um, kind of, you know, hold, you know, even in my 30s, hold my dad's hand so that he looks less threatening because he's holding the hand of a disabled person. Mm -hmm. um, I think that before George Floyd, there was kind of like this duality where you want to talk about black issues and talk about the threat the police have with in regards to blackness. Um, and then you also want to talk about the disability perspective and people seem to think that they're two separate things. Um, and nobody really quite pays attention to the intersection of both. And before George Floyd, there was a lot of disabled people, black disabled people begging people to pay attention to the fact of the high occurrence of black people that are suffering violence at the hands of police who have disabilities. And we are constantly met from both sides of this very liberal argument saying, well, we're, we're, you know, we, if we advocate for one, we advocate for all. And there are some unique challenges the disability community has with both racism and blackness. And we as black people are constantly told to wait our turn to have this conversation later to wait till it's more convenient time to have it. But there's never gonna be a convenient time to have this conversation. And so when with George Floyd, people were forced to pay attention because 40 million people are out of work. We're in the middle of a pandemic in which black people are dying at three times the rate of white people. We are stuck at home. We are terrified for our lives. And so when we see somebody dying on our cell phone every single day and somebody is smirking on our camera phones with their knee on a man's neck as he pleads for his life, it forces people to pay attention. And so as black disabled people, we have kind of slipped in and said, this is not uncommon. And we are at most risk for police violence. And we need both black people to claim their disabilities and claim the people with disabilities in their lives, as well as acknowledge this unique threat to have this conversation with any sort of depth and to be able to move the conversation forward. Yeah, and Kevin, do you think you have, would like to add something to that as well? I know you do. Oh, I definitely agree. I definitely, and it breaks my heart. You know, when George Floyd died, it was such an impact. Everyone watched and I knew that this, Oh, the intersectionality was very important. And we couldn't separate those two. You know, it was just like it was in your heart. And it was part of each person. And when that happened, I mean, I was heartbroken to actually witness it and have people watching. And, you know, the government. And here it is, the impact of racism. And it happened previously and no one was watching, nobody was paying attention. 
But now we're focusing more and more. You know, I can't even sleep at night. You know, I keep looking back in the past at certain incidents that have been happening. And in the community, it's almost like you're canceling our culture. And you can't do that. You know, I recognized that was happening. And I said, they have to stop it and call out people. And, you know, white people, we have to call out them as well. I don't support certain things. When he died, you know, it was so many things that were being recognized. And racism has to be discussed. We have to open up and share our feelings. We have to be open-minded and willing to have that conversation instead of ignoring it as we had for many years. And then all of a sudden, this situation with George Floyd happens, and they say, oops, I made a mistake. No, but these mistakes have been repeated. And this is a factual mistake, and it's been going on for a long time. So we have to have that conversation. We have to be open-minded, non-judgmental, and not look away, and not ignore it. You know, just as George Floyd uh, said, you know, her daddy died. I was heartbroken. She knew about it was racism. And racism kills. And, you know, people are saying they understand things now. But what about what happened a long time ago? You know, and that's why I had these mixed emotions. You know, it's really serious. And really, you had to look at it and think, it wasn't just something. We, we witnessed a murder, you know. It was it was a murder. He was murdered on camera, and so does anybody want to chime in and actually um, voice their opinions about that or their feelings? Go ahead, Lester. Um, I didn't watch it. Mm -hmm. I chose not to watch it because of the repeated um, things that we've seen. I've I've driven. I drove past a black man just before he was killed by the police. I seen the death that he seen coming in his eyes. Literally, I drove past that. So I couldn't, we've experienced it so much. So before, it was like the white people just letting it happen. And we're just dealing with it and trying to stop it and still live our life. Now with George Floyd, with the, as we've been saying, the pandemic, we're like, it's not going to be happening no more. Some of us know we've been on the we've the internet has been connecting us. We've been seeing our allies. We've been seeing our allies come to our to our support to be like, you know what, we're gonna have to rise up and get this done. We're seeing it. And now when we're coming together as our when our superpowers are being black, being disabled, we're gonna be able to connect the people. But we gotta make sure that we're leading it. Because again. People talk about seeing it. I didn't even want to watch it. I got mad me sent that to me um on like on dope. Like I was already seeing that stuff before it was out there. The whole thing. You know what I mean? Because you know we how we get things on the internet. It was like we said bootleg as we used to do. It was I was, I was like, I'm not even gonna watch it because I understand, feel it. I'm not gonna see it, but I see now how that impacted all of us, and it's gonna be changing people. So I really do believe we're going to have to come together. I, I think that what we'll be able to do is use the things that we've seen. Because a lot of you, I've already heard it. A lot of us know how to be able to connect with the people. We're going to have to be the leaders out here. We're going to we, it's part of our DNA. The more and more we study who we are, we're going to see in our in our DNA of how we are going to be the leaders um, because we're special. When you, had, uh, as, as Imani, uh, uh, um, I'm already up, I'm up on you, girl. I love you already. And she's already said, you know, we, we're, we're really going to be doing something big here. We really are going to be doing something big here. And I see us being able to connect so much that we're going to be leading things and making changes. So we can look at the past and know we've lived and struggled through a whole lot, but now we're about to connect the things that's going to make us stronger and that certain things that people maybe didn't want to acknowledge, mm -hmm. being black, being disabled, all these identities that we have, 
Let's bring them together because it's going to allow us to be able to move things forward because I don't know about you guys, but I look at the world as like we're meant to be thinking about the future. And we know that the, the small things that make us different also make us similar. So the things that we're allowing to make sure that we can point out being black, being disabled, we're going to use them as superpowers to say they make me special. I'm different, but they also make me powerful, but they also show that we all can be together. Because we can see when we bring our blackness and our disability together, we can see how they link up to make us stronger. Okay, let me ask another thing where, all right, has anybody had a situation with police officers or the police that, I mean, a negative or you felt, because I know that um, that made you, I mean, fearful with your disability, like they didn't understand what you, how your disability interact or they didn't interact with you well. Has anybody ever had any of those issues or want to talk about it? I mean, I, I've had an issue, I've had an issue where um, there was a call here for one of my neighbors and, you know, we have a tight knit block and, you know, she wasn't, she was on her way back home, but her, her oldest child was watching the children. This was a little later at night. Her oldest child is, is a teenager, so it's not like a little child. Um, and I came down to speak to the officers because the, the mother had called me um, just to make sure everything was all right. And, you know, it, it was one of these situations where everything went from like zero to 60 in a matter of a second because, you know, one of the officers decided that he wanted to, you know, show his authority and put his chest out when I was nothing but respectful. But this is not the first time I've dealt with, you know, with cops and treating them with respect only to be given disrespect in return. Um, this seems to be a common, a common theme in a lot of ways when they feel as though you're challenging their authority when it's not about authority as much as just showing common decency to one another. Long story short, you know, I asked him for his badge number and his name, which he refused to give me. And he was kind of a, you know, quite honestly, he was an asshole. Uh, his partner just kind of sat on watching instead of saying anything. And, you know, it sucks because he was a black cop on top of that. But when I reached in my pouch to grab a pen so I could take down his badge number, he put his hands on his gun as if somehow or another I was going to be the one who's going to be doing something to him. You know, and I always find it interesting how, you know, yeah, there's a point in time where we all need the cops, but at the same time, we also need the cops to come in not acting like, you know, um, Rambo in a situation that requires, you know, a delicate touch. And far too often we have cops who are ill-trained who come in to situations with um, uh, basically with a baseball bat when they really kind of just need a feather um, to make things go away. And I can only imagine what it's like to somebody like Kevin or anybody who's deaf, who quote unquote can't hear an officer to give a command and then assumes that they're being uh, belligerent or ignoring them but the reality of it is, is they can't hear them and not understanding that then get escalates the situation, which is another issue um, that seems to be problematic with a lot of police in this country is not de-escalation, but escalations of situations and, uh, that don't need to happen. Even with the George Floyd situation, if you looked at everything that led up to um, him, you know, him being murdered, everything seemed to be fine in the grand scheme of things. No one seems to can answer the question, well, how is it that you guys had him in cuffs? You let him away, all of a sudden put him in a different car, and now he's not in that car, but now on the ground being choked out. No one can answer that question. But for everyone, George Floyd, you got 20, 30 people who don't get the same press. We're still now hearing about people who died in similar fashions to George Floyd, or if not worse, that we're now hearing because they're hiding all the evidence from from the people so it's a worse situation than what people make it out to be Brian, you want to add anything yeah i've um not had an experience with the police directly but uh i had a roommate who had a psychotic break and uh because she was um getting violent we didn't really have any other option but to call the police and i think um one of the reasons in you know, why we need to really be thinking about um, at, at the very least defunding the police um, is to really consider, you know, like what is behind the way that we react to 
Black disabled people? You know, like why are we specifically targeting them, targeting us and seeing us as a threat that needs to be taken care of? You know, like we're actually the ones that need help here in this situation or we're the ones who are dealing with something that we cannot control. And I think um, part of what needs to happen is our, a reframing of our understanding of what, not only what um, violence means, but also what justice means and what it looks like to have a community kind of response to something that may be difficult or problematic. And Kevin, do you want to just talk about some of the issues I know that um, being deaf and interacting with the um, police department? And I know that um, what could probably be some of the things that they could do to work better with the deaf and hard of hearing community? Yeah, yeah, I really appreciate uh, offering that to you. Um, I grew up, you know, Black, of course, and I feel that I've been identified myself as deaf. My parents always said, no, you're Black, first and foremost. And I think, no, I'm deaf. But actually, now with this police situation, I grew up and I look at the, as a teenager, I had to realize the way the world looked at me, I realized I am Black. You know, that they look at me as a Black suspect first. You know, I think I'm deaf, but they don't know that when they look at me. The police are more sensitive to the deafness. When you, when they realize that, they soften a little bit because uh, the deafness they can feel a little bit empathetic about. But I smile, and that seems to calm them down a little bit. So the deaf situation, let me tell you what happened last year. A few of us were out, and I couldn't, the police came and they grabbed me. And it was a white man who was deaf. I'm sorry. And uh, I told him, you couldn't do that. You're lucky a white man got let go. But if I, oh, I was out with a couple of friends and they grabbed, the white guy was acting, the white guy was acting up and they ignored him. They found out he was deaf and they did not grab him. I told my white friend, if I had done that, they would, I would have never been able to do that. They would have grabbed me. It would have been a problem if I had been doing the same thing you were doing. So, the, and in a different situation, we were sitting on a, a bench and the police came over, you know, and the, and the sergeant came and asked, you know, there were different deaf issues in the community and he asked about it. So, you know, I'm really tall. I'm a big black guy, you know. So the cop and I were talking and ASL is very expressive. I've got a lot of body language, but a lot of facial expression, and it's 70% facial expression, body language, and so forth. When I finished, I was being friendly, having a conversation about deaf issues. I went to go to the bathroom, and when I came back from the bathroom, the police, there was a whole crowd, and they had said, Kevin needs not to be so aggressive and ex expressive, because if he does that in the street, he would get attacked and arrested. I mean, he could get wrestled down. And I realized, oh my goodness, just my deaf culture, just my deaf language makes me a, a, a target. Just expressing how I feel and giving a story because it's expressive physically and expressive emotionally, just telling a story. In that one time when I told the policeman in a safe place, he completely misunderstood me. So it makes me realize I have to stand still, no facial expression, no emotion, in order to tell a story. In ASL, that's not how a story goes. But I was trying to explain to a policeman about how it does work, and they didn't understand me. That was very impacted for me. Police need to have some more cultural sensitivity training so that they could understand clearly that in deaf culture, just because I'm talking loudly or my face looks active or my body is moving does not mean I'm angry or aggressive. It just means I'm telling a story and they overlook all of my culture and it shouldn't be that way. So how does it make you feel when you're a person with disabilities and you might communicate yourself, communicate in a different way, or you might just with your disability might cause a different type of interaction with a police officer or just anybody being a black person with a disability. 
anybody, I just want for anybody want to just answer that chime in. Well, Kevin did want to say something else about. Oh, go ahead, Kevin. I'm sorry. I wanted to let the police know that I'm deaf and I can't hear the noises. So I have black skin, of course I do, but you can see that, but you can't see the deafness. He did not want to hear that the deafness was impactive and that my language was part of my culture and my being and my deafness. What he wanted me to do was understand that I needed to change and that my that he didn't want to come to my world and match me. He wanted me to go into his world and match him and to calm down and to speak more calmly and to not have facial expression. I would respect that, but he should respect me at the same time. He yeah. should understand you can't just usurp our culture with yours. You need to be able to respect ours and then let that be part of the interaction. Mm -hmm. And also, I just wanted to mention that people tend to talk about the police, but it happens. If you were really to tell a story in ASL, the police would actually misunderstand. Mm -hmm. And they should be there to protect us, as someone has mentioned earlier. However, that tends to be the opposite sometimes. I mean, you see me right now. You see me doing facial expressions. You could assume that I'm being angry, but I'm not. But you could just by watching me. And if I had the same conversation in the street, you would pull out a gun and somebody would say, oh, Kevin wasn't angry. He was just telling the story as part of ASL. Too late. Sorry. Already shot him. You have to be careful. You have to assume, uh, avoid assumptions. Yeah. And I think a lot of people don't really understand the different cultures within the disabilities community, which is get sometimes get lost in people thinking that they have or know what diversity really is or inclusion really is when they really don't in that diversity and inclusion training don't train about disability, you know, in our cultures and our different cultures within the different parts of our community have no idea what it is. So they don't really do a full training because they really don't know us. Um, and so when you, I guess anybody, go ahead. What did you want to say something, Jill? Yeah, no, isn't that kind of the problem? And it's always been the problem within 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 this country, but with and to a certain degree within like human, you know, human nature is the want other people to try to understand them versus them understanding us. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? It, it's it's one of these weird things. It's like, you know. Um, we want to train monkeys to understand human talk, but we don't want to understand monkeys talk. You know what I mean? Like, it's the same thing with like dolphins. Like we're trying to train dolphins to, to understand humans talking, but we don't want to understand a dolphin. So the same thing goes into play when it comes to anybody else. Doesn't matter what community you come from. It, it's, there's differences with, with everything. And to expect to then say, okay, well, you've got to, You've got to, I've got to understand you. And if I don't understand you, then something's wrong with you versus like you not even trying. And that's always been the case. It's like, you know, when the colonizers came to America, instead of trying to understand the natives who were here, they try to indoctrinate them into Christianity. And if they weren't Christians, they would burn them at the stake. It, it's all kinds of crazy stuff that would happen based purely on a notion that I refuse to understand you, you have to understand me. And as it stands right now, when it comes to policing, it's, it's, at the, it's either at the barrel of a gun or at, at, at the hit of a, of, a, of a billy club or pepper spray or some other thing that's not, that can't be even used in combat. Yeah. yeah, but I also think too, there's, there's a certain issue when it comes to black people in public space. Like we are always seen as infringing upon whiteness and whiteness is space. And so we're, when we're in public and emoting and we are just living our lives, I mean, there was a video of a, of a group of young black boys who were just walking down the street and neighbors called the police because they didn't belong there. And we keep thinking that it's a matter of like, there's an equal cultural exchange. This is the cultural ex exchange. This is what has been, you know, indoctrinated into America, period about what blackness is, it's always seen as a threat. And so when we talk about training and when we talk about um, defunding the police, one, one of the things I have to ask is like, how much can we train this American racism out of American policing? Like how much are we going, how far is that gonna get us in terms of making black people, black disabled people safer when this is the, the entire ethos of this country? 
you know, it doesn't end with the police. It starts with people, white people who are, who feel like we're infringing upon their space. We're in their neighborhoods at the wrong time. We're bird watching at the wrong time. We're in too loud at the wrong time. We're getting coffee at the wrong time. It does like, <laughs> do we train white people to interact with black people first? Because they're the ones calling the police on us nine times out of 10. Yeah. And so we can, we can ask to retrain the police and to be honest, I don't see that going very far because they've been trained, <laughs> to be honest, they're trained really well at what they do. What they do is harm though. Um, so how far are we gonna get with this idea that um, we are going to retrain th this one sector of society when it's the entire system that is built around racism? Yeah, yeah, yeah I, I definitely would agree. I, I personally hate the, I, I don't like the notion of defund because it just has a weird connotation with it. Um, Cause it's, it, I mean, technically, yeah, their funding needs to be restructured, sure. Um, but the idea that it, you know, it, it, it's just a weird talking point for me um, because it does have to happen, not, not in the grand scheme of things. Obviously there's a, there's a place, there's a place for police and for policing, but the reality of it is, is, I mean, I don't know about you, but I can raise my hand and tell you how many times I've driven around and I've seen cops just sitting there parking and I'll go somewhere and be back an hour and see that cop still parked there in the same hour. So there can't be that much crime or that much stuff going on that would make it so that they would have to be everywhere because if they're not there, all of society breaks down when it, we know fundamentally that's not true. In many cases, in many places, the cops are, are, are basically, you know, weaponized tax collectors because all they do is give out speeding tickets in some places because crime rates are so low. Crime rate as a whole is low, but we never ask the question of why are the way things are. Um, as far as, you know, I, I would agree with you in relation to the whole idea with, with, with the spaces if we're intruding. And I think that's kind of the problem is that, you know, uh, people are in their isolated pockets Therefore, they don't know anybody who's different from them. And so they accept whatever they see as being the reality. And in many places, in many countries, the first, the first interaction with people of color is through media. And if the media shows us as being bad people, then everybody, it starts a, a snowball effect of everybody else looking at us as being the world's enemies. It, it does, it, I've traveled before. You know, I've gone as far as Australia. And the thing that, that, that always seems to bug me is how is it that in this world where, where fundamentally black people and most people of color have zero power, we are the most vile, bad people ever when we're not the ones dropping bombs, we're not the ones coming and invading and colonizing and shoving religion down anybody else's throats. I never could understand why we are the villains in so many stories. You want to say something? Um, Kevin, I think you wanted to say something. Yeah, I did. Um, wait a minute. Let me think a second. Imani, you were talking, and I wanted to say something in relation to what you said. Oh, yeah. When you talk about retraining the police, I agree with you, Imani. I mean, they do need to be retrained. However, like you said, the police used to get retraining, and they, they were retrained one time on death issues. Apologize, my device just froze. Jackie, can you take up what he's saying? I'm sorry, so what my happened, device froze and I need Jackie to take over. Yeah. So what happened was you know, when you were talking about that situation with the police, and they do need training. But you know who they want to hire for training? They want hearing people. I said, no, you need a deaf person to train the police. You know, these people with disabilities should, you know, train the police officers, you know, because we're living through our disabilities. We know what's going on. We know our hearts. They don't know. The police have no idea. They just know the white system and they go along with that. They don't know how we feel. And again, they do need training. They definitely, they have to emphasize who's going to do the training. Because if not, it's not going to be successful. And they have to have a culturally appropriate match 
if the people, if they're trying to deal with the people with disability, with disabilities, then they need their training, just like with the deaf community. They would need to be trained by the deaf community. We have to make sure that we have the appropriate matches when it comes to training the police. So let me, um, we talked about that. Um, during COVID, this whole COVID-19 and us being trapped in our homes and, um, do you feel like there was a lot of information shared for our community or do you think our community was left out in a lot of ways of just knowing um, what to do, how to protect yourselves? And even with the reopening, do you think that our community has been involved with that process? Um, I, 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 I'm sorry, somebody, does somebody else want to go before me? Uh, um, you can go ahead, Jilla. Because I know, I think Amani and Brian both was want to jump into that one. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I just feel like like in both si in, in all situations, we're kind of left out. You know what I mean? In a grand scheme of things. I mean, I look around and I'm like, well, how do I desanitize my wheelchair every time I go somewhere or every time I touch something? And then, okay, we're reopening and like, yo, I like to go out to eat while they're doing, you know, you know, a rush situation with, with the way uh, they're doing outdoor seating. So there's bench seatings. There's no place for me at the table, more or less. I mean, some places do make, do try to make accommodations. So I'm not going to make it seem like it, it's, it's, you know, all, you know, uh, you know, it's all one sided, but at the end of the day, like, this is what happens when, you know, you don't do what you, you know, when you don't do for the least of us, you don't do for the rest of us. And so if you look at, you know, just doing something that's just basic for everybody, you assume everybody's like that then, you know, it leads to problems, but, you know, opening doors. Well, if you don't sanitize the door and I got to push my wheelchair through, well, now my hand, my hand rims are all, you know, messed up and, you know, maybe infected. So like when you're dealing with hardware versus something else, I can only, like I said, some things I can only imagine and you're just seeing it and like some of the pro protection protocols that are put in place are not at all wheelchair friendly so this like ada support is out the out the door as far as any of that stuff is concerned so it's a very interesting dynamic to look at this and i'm like looking around and just seeing how things can be done differently but it's so rushed because everybody's concerned about their money and so if they're a capitalist and you have something in the table only thing you care about is money you don't care about anything else and that's just basically what's happening and why we're back in a situation where and now with COVID, it's because everybody the rich are not getting richer yeah brian or on the money? Yeah, um, just to add to that, I, you know, I completely agree. Like, you know, in this age of COVID, um, there will be no going back to normal. Just putting that out there. This is our new state of being. Like, there's no such thing as normal. Um, anyway, and I just um, am thinking now back like to the very beginning when people were just starting to talk about COVID and they say certain things like oh well you know you'll be fine if you're not sick or elderly you'll be fine but really what are we doing about those people who are disabled and sick you know what are we doing about catering to those communities that we just push off to the side because they're they're quote unquote disposable right we're seen as quote unquote disposable because we're not in the majority, we're not in the, the front of people's minds. Um, and now that we're in a place to which we have to contend with our own mortality and the mortality of other people, it really is showing, like people are showing who they are now more than ever. And um, I just think that when I'm like thinking about who I want to be in social media or who I want to be like the kind of stories that I want to put forth. I'm always coming back to the same problem. Like I have to be the one to create the kind of um, information that I want to put out there. Like I, I and my community, us black disabled folks have to be the ones to show other people our experience when, you know, it should be the other way around. Like there should be things in place for my experience to exist in tandem with yours or with, you know, your grandma or, you know, whoever, right? So, um, yeah, I think that's that's pretty much what I wanted to say. Amani, you want to say something? I always want to say something. <laughs> um, you know, I think early on, 
a lot of black disabled people could kind of predict the way things were going to go in terms of information as well as um who's dying because it's mostly indigenous black people latinx people um queer people too who are you know not accounted for in a lot of uh studies um because of the denial of care and i think that you know, when I, once Ayanna Presley called for the data on who was dying on COVID, I knew exactly the way it was going to go. Um, they were going to basically say it was mostly Black people, mostly sick people, mostly elderly people, and nobody was going to care. And that's exactly what's happened. Um, and in terms of what our community needs, in terms of information, um, we can't, a lot of the institutions that are giving us information are historically untrustworthy in our communities. You know, we think about the Tuskegee experiment, Henry Lax, and the ways in which our DNA and our bodies are used for scientific development for white people. Um, there's going to be an inherent mistrust of those institutions in giving us information about what to do in response to this pandemic. Um, and there's so many more ways in which we are getting screwed <laughs> with this pandemic. You know, in terms of joblessness, Black people are the first ones to lose their jobs, and they were probably the last ones to get hired back. Um, they are usually the people who are first evicted, Black women especially, are usually the first evicted um, and have the highest rates of homelessness when it comes to evictions. And so this is a cascading failure. Um, and when we think about um, climate change and when we think about, um, if we think about the pandemic as a natural disaster, this is a prediction of what is to come. Um, black people, indigenous people, and people of color, especially disabled people of color, are the most likely to, to be uh, harmed by natural disasters, harmed by climate change in the near future. And if we think about this as a prediction of what's going to come next, I am deathly afraid of what's going to happen in this community. Because if given any indication about what's happened in the last four months, we will not survive the next five years. So it's really important that we get politicians, that we get allies, uh, that we get people who are really concerned about our lives to buck up and get things going because we can no longer afford to wait for people to decide that they, they think our lives matter. You know, I can no longer wait for people to, to, to sidle up to me and say, oh, I didn't understand this. I, I'm just learning this now. There are books, there's Google. Do not waste black disabled people's times on trying to explain to you their trauma in order to move ahead in the future because we don't have any more time left. This is now, this is happening right now. And if we do not pay attention, if we do not make some um, significant moves in the right direction, we will not be here. You're absolutely right. Now, what do you think now? <laughs> There's, we had the whole riots, looting, and um, the protests after um, the George Floyd, and then we had COVID, everything mixed in that. What makes you, what do you think made the powers of be and everybody really recognize that they needed to do change? Do you think it was the protest, the rioting, or it was the looting that made people really, because I think, do you think the actual, People weren't really hearing it as much after the death until the civil unrest started to happen. Do you think that it had played a big part in it? Go ahead, Kevin. Okay. Now, I want to speak about the COVID-19 situation, okay. that, that topic. Okay, thank you. Now, in the deaf community, we really were impacted the most, um, you know, because that deaf uh, community with that disability, our access to information is limited. You know, interpreters were staying home. Of course, they have to save their lives, and we understand that. But now, what I'm, you know, watching the hearing people are lucky because they have the um, access, they can, they have certain apps, they have text. However, in the deaf community, how do we get to communicate? You know, we you need to use the apps. Now the interpreters can use it back and forth, but we don't have that technology available to us. 
And so just like Imani said, now it's important. We have to save our lives because you know what? Five years from later, we may not be. We have, have to catch up on this app. And, you know, we need this information, you know, so we need the apps because here people have the access. We don't. We lag in information. And at the same time, in New York, you know, they had interpreters in a small bubble and we couldn't see them. So they needed to be enlarged so they would be visible. And in California, they didn't even have any interpreters. Wasn't captioned, no access. And some of the deaf people do not have good English skills. So they needed interpreters, I think. And what was more recognizable, more recognizable to have the interpreters on TV so I could watch the interpreters and I'd have clear communication and I could get the information. I'd have that access. You know, if not, I'd have to figure out and depend on the caption and figure out what's going on. But once I had the interpreters, I was delighted. You know, CDC, you know, needed to provide, you know, things through technology to have the interpreter. You know, they gave a lot of data on COVID-19 and the interpreter would be able to interpret the information. I think that's what they should have. You know, it's more of a problem when they disseminate the information and they make mistakes and things are missing and deaf people are not getting the access. So CDC should recognize that they do, they should get an interpreter quickly so that we can have that communication and have access to the information that's being discussed within the community. You know, because they have that uh, ADA and, you know, we need that access to the communication within the deaf community. I mean, that's how we were impacted. It, it, it was really horrible for us. And that was a, it wasn't good for us at all. So Kevin says that it's better access with interpreters and I know Monty was saying that um, had to get more engaged with um, officials to make sure that they know um, more about our communities and and add more um, information and services to it. Do anybody else um, think what else needs to change you know that can help our community be more um, knowledgeable about what's going on with COVID, you know? Is there any other things that you think that people need to hear or know about? Anybody? Lester? Okay. All right. One of the things I definitely think we need to hear and understand is um, the, the need for us all to get that information, how important it is. We understand how we're seeing how it's impacting uh, um, our deaf community. We understand we have to understand that we're going to have to be speaking for each one of us. You know, we're going to make sure that we're going to have to make sure that we're not we're not only speaking for ourselves. We're speaking for others, not only ourselves, because we're going to be thinking about ourselves and our needs. But we're going to have to be thinking about our others, and others, and their needs too. So something that kept I was writing down in here is you know in my job. I could see that there was the lack of information getting down to the people. Um, as the King talked about, um, individuals just having a clean, cleaning products to keep their wheelchairs clean. You know, so you know, one of the things that we're going to have to do is take, think about the past of we, where we've come from, how we pulled one another up, and know that them, that government's not going to be there. But our people are going to be there. Our people, we're going to have to start, you know, use the internet to, to, to connect to one another too so we can make sure we're all taken care of. Um, so like what I'm hearing is like we know we're in a pandemic, but back to our superpower, we've lived through so much. We are the original people. We're going to show how strong we are. We're now, we're going to be like, look, we're going to make sure we take care of ourselves because Miss Imani didn't put it back in my head how important this is again to make how sure I'm screaming loud again to make sure we know that it, there's no more time to play the games with you guys. It's over. Like, we can't. Because Kevin reminds me of how the deaf, the deaf community, they were one of our first communities that broke off and said, if you do not want to be part, well, you don't want to accept us, 
We will create our own language. We'll create our own culture. And said, you know what? We're going to make it without you. So we got to remember, we can, we're going to bring all our, our ancestors' history to, back to us. And like, we're not going nowhere. And we're going to stay strong. So one thing I want us all to hear, and remember the information we want to get out, is how strong we are. Listen. Be willing to listen. And uh, use this internet to connect. Like, and be like, we're going to use our powers of, we're not going anywhere. We're going to be strong. We are proof that we have been here before with long, a long time, and nothing's going to stop us. We, 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 we know about our ancestors told us, even when we were young, we knew that we were thinking about the next generation. So we're going to be doing that. But we now we got to know how we're going to be making sure we do it now and keeping connected and learning things from our like sisters and, and brothers that are telling us, let's get keep this fight back going. So making sure that we know what we need to get out with this COVID is it's back. It's time to be fighting back again. Don't and, and learn the new normal that we have to to fight again. Okay, you touched on something that I think we I think that's the next thing. And you said, um, Lester, you talked about the past, and Brian, you talked about the this is not normal. But we hear this um, new, this thing called about the new norm. What is the new norm when it comes down to disability and being black with a disability. Um, anybody want to jump into that? How do you feel and what do you think is the new norm? Kevin, you raise your hand. Go ahead. Go ahead, Kevin. Okay, thank you. Now, the new norm, as I envision it, means it's different. We have to be more flexible, and I picture technology, people uh, staying home, you know. I thought, you know, you know, we would have uh, a match with the deaf community and that we would have access and work to make the technology better. But actually, in that reality, it's really worse for us. Because in the deaf community, you know, it's hard for us to get the mask. We can't read lips. We can't see the lips, we can't see the expressions. And, you know, this is what our language is based on. We can't get the information. We can't see. So I'm looking at a person and, and I don't understand. And, you know, I know we need the mask to, to prevent the spread of COVID-19. And I look at CDC's guidelines and they talk about who does not have to use the mask, and they'll say hearing impaired. And we don't have to use the mask? Definitely not. I have to use the mask. And I have to inform them that we need a visible mask, a mask in which we can see clearly and be able to see the lips and everything. So that's as if they're oppressing us. They're oppressing the deaf community and just disregarding us as a community. And I don't want to die. I'm deaf. I don't want to die. So they need to look into it and make a mask that is deaf friendly where we can actually see a person's lip. That's an important thing. And I think with the new norm, you know, I thought we would work together, you know, because we're staying home. People are more motivated, you know, in using technology. However, is that is as if we've been ignored. And it really, you know, it's an awful situation. And honestly, every day I just wonder, you know, how many deaf people are dying because they tell us we don't have to use a mask. And that's a scary situation. And, you know, that's our new norm. And, uh, King, I think you wanted to say something. Yeah, I, for one, wanted to thank Kevin for being here because he definitely gave me some thought. Uh, about things, you know, from a different perspective that I didn't take into consideration um, of how difficult it would, would be for somebody in, in his situation to communicate, um, especially when it's so much that goes on in relations to being able to see people's lips moving and things like that. I know it would be difficult. The only, only, the only real solution is having one of those clear face masks that would allow him to still be able to talk to people and have a mutual understanding and I think it does help it's not quite the same as a mask but I think that's better than nothing because having a clear mask really is kind of defeats the purpose to be perfectly honest I don't know whether there's a material that's even clear enough 
to be able to see through, unfortunately. Um, but I think that like America, America is a country that seems to forget where what we've been through and how to advance because there's so many people who continue to hold on to old ways of doing things. And because it worked for them, thinks that it should work for everybody else. Um, so the new norm may come back as long as we keep the same the same idiots in, in, in power that we consistently do. And we still have people who vote against their best interests for the sake of single uh, issue votes. You know, um, say what you will about certain issues, you know, in relation to where you live or, you know, where you live and die on that on a sword. But you got a lot of people who will die on a sword because of abortion. You know, which is which is a personal issue in my book, regardless of how I feel about it. It's still a personal issue. They'll die on that same sword because and vote for people who will be against it. You know, who will be against it, but also will be against the fifteen dollar an hour minimum wage. I don't know if anyone knows or seen the article recently about how basically minimum wage you can't even afford an apartment now, and, and minimum wage in no state in this country. So, you know, as we start talking about these things and about our own, um, you know, a, a lot of the things that we do as far as our independence is concerned, it becomes more and more difficult for us as a whole. Um, and not just because of COVID, these things have always existed, to be perfectly honest with you. Anywhere you go out, like, you know, you see senior citizen discounts, what reality of it is, a lot of us live on the same subsidies as senior citizens, but we're still paying full price, so we're still taxed the same way. We're still hit upside the head the same way. So for me, I'm a little less optimistic because people are stupid and stupidity is contagious, unfortunately. You know, um, and people enjoy being stupid. And like somebody else said, you can Google, you can do this, you can find all the facts you want out here and you still dive into stupidity. I don't get it, I will never get it. Critical thinking is lost in this country. At some point in time, we are going to have to build our own table and say we have got to be satisfied with what we can do for now. At some point in time, people have got to recognize that this is the one community that at any given time, anybody can be a part of. You can be healthy today and in a wheelchair the next. You can be, you can be hearing one day and death the next. You, I, I mean, like you can, you can see one day and blind the next. So at any given time, you can be a part of our community. And if you are, again, not looking at what you do for the least of us, at some point in time, you're going to be in that same position, and then you're wondering why things aren't the way they are, and it's because you were one of those single vote issue people who thought it was okay not to do for what you see the least of us. Um, I don't know if you guys remember, but when Obama was still in office and they came together to try to make it so that the ADA was something that was global, it was a global standard, how, you know, one side of the aisle decided to vote against it when it had no repercussions on anything. If, if we all have anything to even thank Republicans for in the grand scheme of things, it is for the ADA for, for you know, for what it, for, for where it got started. And they couldn't even get that right to say we're, what we're trying to implement can be used for everybody. Curb cuts, everybody uses a curb cut. Let there not be a curb cut. And even people who have zero problems walking will bitch and fit about it because it's convenient now. This is how it starts. We start with the little things. We make things more universal one step at a time we do things that benefit everyone because ultimately like i said what you do for the least of us you do for the rest of us hey imani you chopping at the best i can see it go ahead oh, <laughs> wait <laughs> well i wanted to go off of what king said where it's like people they're not single voter issues that's uh, that's kind of what i want to push back on it's mm -hmm. all a system of white supremacy coded into single issue uh politics essentially and one of the things that I, I feel like we need to really start to talk about or, or continue to talk about, because a lot of us are talking about it, is the way in which ableism, disability discrimination, bolsters white supremacy. And so the whole reason why we think of these things as single voter issues is because we like the one side will separate them out and say, oh, I'm voting on this issue, I'm voting on this issue. When you look at it all together, it is one issue, it's white supremacy. And they're voting for it every single time, regardless of what their actual needs are. Because to be able to say to one group of people, you're less than me, I, you know, you, are, you don't need um, any sort of social security, you don't need any sort of benefits or welfare or, or a social safety net, it takes away from everybody and the rich get richer. White supremacy is, th is profitable. 
And that's the very first thing we need to address is that it is profitable. And that's why um, billionaires made what, $500 million, sorry, $500 billion as 40 million people lost their jobs during this pandemic. And so it's not necessarily voting against their own need. They, white supremacy is their need. They want it. And so when we, start to, when we start to have these conversations, we have to think about the intersectionality of them all. Because pro-choice, um, anti-ableism, those are all, on, that's the same platform. It is human rights. Um, and so I have, you know, in the future, what I'm seeing right now is a trend in which non-disabled people are really starting to recognize the ways in which ableism and disability fits into their daily life. Um, and I predict in the future, an accessibility crisis that we have not dealt with in, in any sort of capacity because we have hundreds of thousands of people uh, recovering from COVID-19 who are now disabled. And it's not as simple as people, you know, tweeting back and forth, just go on disability. The system is broken. The system, you know, if 40 million people applied for unemployment and barely got in by the skin of their teeth at the beginning of this pandemic, imagine what it's going to be like next year in six months when hundreds of thousands of people are applying for disability and the system that they think exists doesn't exist in the way that they think it does. Um, and so we have to really start thinking about community care. We just start thinking about accessibility as a community need, not necessarily an individual need. And we have to stop thinking about accessibility as one size fits all. The same things that I need as somebody who uses crutches are not the same things that somebody who is deaf or somebody who uses a wheelchair or somebody who has mental illness needs to go about their day. Um, and so I would hope in the future we build a better system for, for our community. But if history is anything to go by, uh, I'm not exactly optimistic about people's capacity to retain their attention on this issue going forward. Um, once people are out of sight, out of mind, and once this crisis, you know, gives way to people wanting to get back to normal. So what do you think is... Um... Chuck, can I, can I add something to what Amani said? Because I actually, I like everything that she said, to be honest with you. Um, and, and when we're talking about the broken system and about, about, about disabilities and things, one of the things that we seem to feel, feel realize too is how punitive uh, disabilities are treated in relations to growth in this country versus other countries. And we, that's a conversation we rarely hear about in that like, yo, you know, if you have $2,000, if you have over $2,000 in your account, somehow or another you're wealthy, you know, um, and you're penalized at every aspect for every dollar that you get. They want two back. And it's like, wait, I'm, I've been I'm living in abject poverty. Like my life doesn't change instantly because I get a couple bucks in my pocket. Then you add to that the amount of people who are inevitably going to be getting on disability for whatever reason, whether it be COVID, because they can't get a job and they do have some type of disability, but they don't qualify for anything else. It is going to be a nightmare waiting. And it like, so those of us who have a different me, as Imani said, are going to be, who are already on the back burner are going to be off the burner because of everybody else who's now a part of that situation. I mean, like you think about it, drug addiction is now considered a disability. So is alcoholism. You know what I mean? So, so, so those things now start taking preference over actual physical disabilities and needs. Like it, it, it's, it's, it's crazy, but I totally agree with you, Amani. And I'm sorry, I worded that in the way I, I worded it, but like, I, I look at that from that single issue voter, because it, it just, I, I look at it as being voting against your better interest. So when you have poor white people who say, you know, who, who think um, a certain, a certain group of people are getting things that, aren't owed to them or they're lazy and things like that. I look at it as them being single issue voters. So you keep voting for that system that you talked about, Imani, but at the end of the day, not realizing that you're victimizing yourself in the long run. So of course you're not getting ahead because you think that you're a part of this group when you're really not. Yeah. Um, I think Lester wanted to, uh, oh, Kevin wanted to say something too. So. Yeah, Oof, this, this conversation. Uh, is interesting. Lester, what you just said, and King, I'm so happy you made those comments. You know, 
there are so many isms, so many isms. You know, there's racism, and then there's, that impacts all of them, you know, impacts all the other isms. So if you look at the whole systemat, systemic impact of the whole thing and how it all breaks down, is the, the racism is, is systemic. It's hard to get out of it. It's hard to pull yourself away from it. The isms need to be solved, but we need to notice people, you know, more discussing more of it and, and making pathways. You know, 100% white, straight, male, Christian men, they, that doesn't apply to us at all. That, they need to stop running the world or people thinking they run the world. 99% of the world cherish us. I mean, if you, 75% don't have jobs right now. I mean, I'm sorry, my computer froze again. Jackie, would you speak for him, please? And, you know, those with the deaf disabilities and those left in the deaf community are lost. You know, you know those jo jobs are gone. You know, and that's really awful. So this way, we have to tear down that system. You know, that systemic racism. We have to. Thank you. Lester, you want to say something? Oh, great, guys. I'm loving how things are going. Like, I really am excited. You know, one of the things I wrote down was, you know, we're going to have to, that don't mean our superpowers, guys. We have, like, I want us to be optimistic because we, we have endured so much that we're still here. And we're going to be leading. We are leading. We, we, like my man King said, everybody got the curve cut down. If they didn't get the curve cut, that's we're part of that. You know, when, we st when you st study the disability rights movement, you understand how the Black Panthers were part of that. We are part of the, we're part of the change that is coming. So we're taking the banner up now. So, it, it, and so what I want to make sure that we know that, that we're going to use our empower, we're going to empower ourselves by educating ourselves, making sure we know where we come from as Black people, understand where we come from in Africa and how it is the mother of the planet. And when you bring everything together before, when all the, the continents were together, the center of the Garden of Eden was Africa. So we all know that the human species came from Africa. So we're going we're gonna to take pride in that. Take pride in that. Take very much pride in that. So when you're, when you're bringing that, you're, emp you're empowering yourself. That's my dad. You see, he was, you know how black he was. He was all in the business. <laughs> yeah. All right. And, and then empower, and then empower ourselves to understand the dis the disability rights movement. Because one thing I want y'all to hear is when I studied the disability rights movement, I heard and learned about the deaf culture and how they separated. And I'm keep saying that how they separated from the rest of the world. Said we ain't got time for you if you ain't gonna work with us. And we're gonna know, th and that's what we're saying now. We are coming together. We're going to use the technology. We ain't going to be left behind. We're going to move things forward with this new normal, this new normal, and say, this is the new normal that, uh, that Kevin says we're creating our vision. This is what is going to be the new normal. We're going to make sure that you know that nursing homes are a bad thing because if you have a COVID, everybody in there is going to be dying and nobody will need to be up in here. So we're going to be bringing it. We're going to, we're going to make the things make sense to them because... We are royalty. We know that. We're going to come and be calm and be kings and be queens and let them know you will, you will respect me because I know where I come from. I see it all in you. I see it all in you. This is lovely. This is lovely. So we have a responsibility that we all know that we're going to be taking, taking we, we all know that we're going to take care. We know that we, from our ancestors, we know when we take, we take responsibility and we take that stuff, we take it seriously. You know, so we all going to be taking this stuff that we're all hearing to a whole nother level. The new things we're learning, the, the empowering things that are putting our fi the fire back in us that we're going to be giving to the next generation, all of that. So I'm just, I'm just so great to hear. And, and one thing I want to make sure everybody know that I, because I thought about this a, a minute, you know, we're, we're you're, you know, we're spirits, um, as they say it on, on the internet. Um, we're spirits using human bodies and stuff. So let's let's keep that in mind. So we know that the bodies that we're that we inhabit, we we can identify in so many different ways. So we can bring ourselves together. So we're going to learn about all, all of ourselves. You know, each one of us knows that ourselves. 
So that way, when we come together, we can link up with others that know us, themselves, and we can lead that movement of the human race where we're, remember, at one time, we were hunters and gatherers. So guess what? We're now truly moving into that space of becoming civilized people. So there's going to be some things where there's going to be a lot of fighting, but we got to understand we're moving, moving, moving very far. Thank you. Kevin, you wanted to say something? Yes. Okay, good. Thank you. I just want to make sure it was me. Um, I agree with all of the conversations. Uh, I also want to know that we uh, I'm a member of the Black and Black Be Beautiful. Black is not a terrible word. It's not a, the word. It means you need to be your worth. You need to talk about your worth. You know, people are afraid to use their power, but we've had to fight. We need to use it to fight against the system. And if we're doubtful or if let people preach to us or tell us no, that will stop us. We can't let that happen. We have to fight back. I mean, we have worth, and we need to let the system know black isn't an ugly word. It is not an ugly word. We need to fight, go forward, collaborate, work together, use our community, use our culture, use our group, and realize that black altogether is collaborative. We need to support all of us as black individuals in this huge, amazing world. You know, uh, when we have this conversation, we talk about systemic racism. It's huge. It's an enormous, giant machine, awful machine that's been running for years, and it's been functioning. And it's hard for us to fight against and break down that humongous systemic machine. But we're worth it, and it's worth the effort. And black is a beautiful word. It's the best word. It's the champion word, and we should just embrace it. And that's how we're going to uh, go forth and fight against systemic racism. And so I see that um, one of the things that we talked about that the fight we need to to get change happen happening. So do anybody want to add like what's next? What do you think we as disabled black people? What do you think is next that we should do? I know one of the things that I feel is that we need to start teaching our younger people with disabilities, our younger black community and our younger people with disabilities about the history and empower them to understand that if we don't speak up for one another when we get into the room, we don't share the struggle that each one of us have. If you're black, you're brown, you're white, and you have a disability, I think that we should all continue to share our stories because sometimes <laughs> it's sad that it's okay for just to having one. You got one, that's good enough, okay? That's not good enough. So we know we have to open up the door for others. So I think that we need to really educate and empower our youth with disabilities. Do anybody have anything that they think that should be next and what should be done that we can make some changes, Imani? Yeah. Okay. Um, one of the things- We'll go through the whole room to ask everyone, okay? So go, go ahead, Imani. Oh, one of the things I kind of want to push back on is this talk about Black power. Not necessarily that we're not powerful, but we also need to recognize that we're vulnerable and that we're human and that we're scared and that we're going through trauma. And, you know, we can, we can have all this bravado and bolster and bluster and talk about how our ancestors are powerful and, you know, our, you know, our culture is powerful, but a lot of our power comes from surviving trauma mm -hmm. and coming together through traumatic events like the one we're going through right now. And a lot of the strength and a lot of the perseverance, a lot of that falls to black women and black femmes and non-binary black people to be the backbone and then to turn around and then also experience misogyny and sexism and all that stuff too. So I really want us to be careful to talk about, when we talk about power, when we talk about black power, that we're talking about the fact that we, we, our, our strength comes from, you know, and our culture comes from producing through that trauma and producing art and policy and community and, and support systems through trauma. And so 
I really want us to be careful to kind of not necessarily paint us as superhuman or not needing supports or not needing help because we very much so need help. We very much so need each other. And the thing that I think that we can really all agree on is that we're very scared right now. And that's okay to admit. And that's okay to say to one another, I'm scared, I don't know what to do. I'm having trouble sleeping. I'm having trouble getting the things that I need. Because only then can we start to address one another's needs and say, I've got you, I've got your back on this perspective. Why don't we help one another out with A, B, or C? Um, if we start, if we keep talking about how how our, how our value is in our ability to look the other way when we are punched in the cheek, we will not go forward. <laughs> you know, we will, we will consistently be taking these bruises, taking these punches as a group, and then expecting the next generation, teaching the next generation that it's okay to just turn the other cheek and to just absorb that trauma and not say anything about it. Because that is what we're doing. When we tell people that we can only focus on our strengths, we're telling people that we don't really want to hear about your weaknesses. Um, and as disabled people, we really have to confront our weaknesses on a daily basis in order to get the things that we need. So that's kind of what I see us, see us doing in the near future is addressing the ways in which we are vulnerable and which we, in which we can come together to help one another out. Great. Amani, do you have anything to add? I mean, I'm sorry, um, Bri. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Imani, I love you, but you took the words right out of my mouth. Thank you. Um, <laughs> I mean, I think, yeah, you know, we're thinking about our survival. What does thriving mean? And so much of it is not just like making it to the next day, right? And I walk out of the door. Um, I'm always concerned with like, okay, what am I gonna show up as today? Am I showing up as black today, disabled today, queer today, non-binary today? That's a lot of questions. And you know, white people don't have to go through that. Straight people don't have to go through that. You know, like I'm always constantly thinking about who is not in the room, who is the most multiply marginalized person in the room, like who am I not um, here for like who am I not taking my own responsibility for and giving them the platform you know like what I want to see in a future for black disabled folks is to not just only be um, one thing or another but to be multiplicitous to be multifaceted because we already are you know like we should be allowed to be who we are and take agency and power and in, in the fact that we can be ourselves today, you know, like we can be anything we choose. And I think that when we think about um, Black disabled youth, I'm thinking about all the like Black disabled queer folks, all the Black disabled trans folks who are just trying to survive, you know, and can't because of all of the different systemic issues that come up, that hit up against you as a Black queer person, as a Black trans woman, you know, like there are, there are plenty of Black disabled trans women out there who don't get the services they need because of all of these different areas in which people just don't have a framework, you know, like they just don't know what it takes to take care of one another. And I just, I just want all of us Black queer um, people to know that we can find supporting each other and we can take, we can take um, supporting each other, but we also need to know that we don't necessarily have to cater to anyone else to be who we are. Thanks. Um, let's go to Jilla. You wanna add anything? I'm sorry, what was the question? Just what's next? Huh. I like both the, you know, both the ladies is uh, quite, you know, answers quite frankly. And, you know, it's true. We're dealing with a lot of trauma, you know, um, and, I would say the trauma of being black and then you add the trauma of having to deal with the struggle of being disabled on top of that just adds so much more variety to the situation, which I think also makes us a lot more um, uh, sympathetic and empathetic to a lot of things that are around us as well. And so we tend to, can we, we tend to kind of, I, I guess, I, I guess from from my perspective, I tend to kind of try to see the best in people in situations as mo as best as possible. 
um, but also looking for solutions to, to simple, you know, to complex problems that seems to, in the grand scheme of things, be very easy to fix if, and the, the key and the emphasis has to be on if we want to fix them. You know, uh, case in point, there are a ton of bridges that need to be replaced. We keep talking about how we have no money for X, Y, and Z, but if we really wanted to fix those bridges, we could. Um, and it's the same thing with anything in this country, realistically, is that if we want things to be better, we can make them better, but we have to want to make those things better. And if we make them better, things obviously will be better. Will there be people who will be left behind? Obviously, but if we put in place things that will prevent them from falling behind too far, then we can keep pulling them along with us as we go along. There's always gonna be somebody who needs to be dragged to the next thing, kicking and screaming until they realize that, hey, you know what, this is actually better. Um, and at some point in time, we just have to pull this country in the right direction, kicking and screaming until they realize, hey, you know what, you're right, this is better. Same thing with healthcare, same thing with having minimum wage, same thing with voter rights. You pick almost any issue in relations to what we've had to deal with as a country. And when people have been, had been pulled, kicking and screaming, eventually they figured out that, you know what, this is a better situation. We still got a long way to go, but I think that things can be better, especially if we have people who are very mindful of who they are and what they are and understanding that you don't have to kowtow to be what somebody expects you to be. Um, and I would agree with Brian, like, yo, be the best you. And if somebody doesn't like you, fuck them. I keep it real. All right. Um, last thing. And then we're going to do Kevin next. All right. I'll go and then I'll let the superstar Kev end out. Okay. Yeah. Um, with, with, with that being said, you know, if, no, you don't know. You guys don't know me. I, I was writing. I was prepared. I was trying to be prepared. So, like, outcome, ladies. Uplift the women, yes, because again, my ancestors have taught me. We know who I'm just looking at you guys right now. I know you can't realize I'm trying to give you make sure I'm giving you eye contact. You know about that face to face, remember that. So, I'm trying to look at you both at the same time to let you know, yes, ma'am, I'm listening, I'm understanding that I do have power, but remember, I can't I'm, I'm acknowledge my trauma. I'm gonna be so, so one of the outcomes. We're going to uplift our women, all of us. All of us are going to uplift our women because they are part, if we go back to history about our struggle, if, if we don't up, we have been, they have been one of the first to have been um, marginalized. So if they ain't uplifted, nothing else is going to fall behind it right. So start off, we're uplifting the women. So we're listening to their voice. We're putting them in power position to open to Lead, and I don't mean it in a bad way, but lead the way. Not saying that uh, men can't do it, but guess what? We've been doing it for a long time, and it don't look too right. So why don't we continue to allow the women to lead? So another thing I was thinking about also, the next thing is, as we've been saying, is um, helping our people, un or especially all, whether you're black or white, you on this call, understand identity development as a dis having a disability. So where you're incorporating your uh, disability into your identity. So two uh, things for me, uplift the women uh, and, and develop an identity that incorporates your disability. Great, Kevin. Wow, this is so heartfelt. Now to be honest, you know, black women running is, is beautiful. And they're always right. That's my perspective. You know, I've been seeing how the Black women have been doing the right thing. And, and some of us have been ignored. But we've got to black up. That's what we have to do. We have to collaborate, work together, support one another, and stick together. And then people will see that Black people are serious. You know, Instead of talking about black on black and, you know, people <clears throat> are standoffish and, you know, they don't want to help. So we have to black up and really work together. And that means we have to get away from the systemic ideas. You know, that's 400 years of ideas and we have to break away from that. You know, we don't want to follow that white system. You know, they've been oppressing us and in the 
deaf community, some of us don't have the best English skills and, you know, we may feel oppressed, but we've got to help each other. You know, what we don't have or what we do have, we have to share and collaborate. You know, black up means that we have to use our skills and our talents. If somebody has it, then we've got it. That makes us more powerful because we can share the information, we can share our skills instead of fighting against each other. And then that white system won't have to laugh at us saying that the same thing is going on all the time and that it's a black problem. We have to stop those issues because it's not a black problem. We have to get rid of that, you know? We have we're good people. We have to make good trouble, as uh, Senator Lewis said. And we have to collaborate and make that good trouble. And, and you know, the system will hate it, but their power will dissolve. But we'll be able to beat the system and say, yes, we are the troublemakers. Now what? Come on. We have to really collaborate. And, you know, we have to be prepared for the future and stop the trauma and everything else because the same cycle is going on and it's vicious and vicarious and we have to stop it. It's really serious. We have to show that black identity and show that we are good. And then the other identity will come forth, you know, with that intersectionality and then we'll have the power and then they won't be able to break us. They can't break us. They can't break us. They can't hurt us. They can't hurt tomorrow's leaders because we're black. We have a strong identity and we have it within us. And we have all the, we got to break those isms and just keep leading and move forward. Cool. I want to ask one more question and I'm going to ask this of Imani. And the question, it was a question that we received from the um, audience. What can white disabled or other people of races in the disabled community do to help us as a community and, and be allies to our cause and our movement in creating equality for disabled black people? Sure, um, first I wanted to address one thing. We have to, you know, we have to be very explicit in, in uplifting queer and non-binary people in the struggle as well. We cannot think of race as simply on the binary. So let's make sure that we lift up those voices as well. Um, one of the ways that you could, that is very easy to do is boost the voices of black disabled people on your social media channels, make sure that you're doing the right readings, make sure that you're um, doing the research um, and listening to the discourse that we have um, and not necess and not erasing our experiences simply because you've experienced something similar. I can't tell you how many times I have said I've explicitly expressed it um, an experience that I've had and, and a white disabled person has gone, well, I went through it too, so it couldn't have been because of race. That's not helpful. Let's make sure that we're uplifting black disabled voices, that we are um, sharing information with your white peers who may not have access to those same conversations. Make sure that you're doing the reading, make sure that you are researching all the facts about black disability, especially in media and policing and um, all the different aspects that affect our lives on a daily basis. Um, and then give money to Black disabled led groups, you know, groups that are really working at the intersection of race and disability who are uh, at the forefront. They're, Carrie Gray does a lot of good work. Be Heard does a lot of good work. Um, so make sure that you're uplifting those groups and those uh, advocates who may not always have a platform to speak quite often. I just want to thank you all. Oh, Kevin, you want to say one thing? Go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to add that what people are white to say, but they can become our allies. You know, it doesn't mean they just go ahead and say, oh, I'm an ally. They have to put in the work. They have to advocate, work with us together, ask us what we need instead of saying, you know, uh, we want we don't want to ask them for the read, you know, for the reading material and what it means. You know, don't depend on us with black disabled people as members, we can say you need to do this. And then they need to go ahead and do it. You know, not try to uh, negotiate and, you know, go through a whole lot of uh, running around and they have to 
be physically ready to do what needs to do the work that needs to be done instead of preaching. And, you know, instead of us having to explain all the time, you know, they have to be willing to listen, willing to advocate for us. And don't take our power. Don't take our power away. Leave our power where it is. Let us lead. Let us inform. And, you, and they have to be willing to listen and not try to change everything, you know, to say they don't want to, you know, be val they don't want us to be validated, you know, or they try to validate us. No, we can do that. You know, we live through this every day on a daily basis. They don't. And, you know, you know, they have to give us the privilege back. You know, they have to give us the privilege. You know, whether they're white disabled or just a white person, a binary person, you know, and they notice that something is wrong, then speak up. You know, support us. You know, give us the privilege to be able to lead. You know, they don't keep the privilege and walk away from it. No, they have to support the people that are disabled. They have to stop taking their privilege and using it as if it's okay. You know, and that's what I wanted to say. And just like if there's a person in the wheelchair, how about, a, you know, open the door, you know? You know, so that... You know, as far as ableism, you know, if I had that privilege and there's a person with the wheelchair coming through and I open the door, then that's my privilege to support that person. I'm not going to let the door slam in their face and just walk away. That's an example of using the privilege to support us, you know, to support people who are black and disabled. Thank you. Liz, I just want to thank everybody on the panel. This was wonderful. I mean, you, it was real. It was open. So many people have really chimed in and on chat and was really happy with all of your voices and all of your issues and everything that you share. I thank you all. We called on you and you, no one said no. Everyone jumped in. So you're awesome. Every single one of you. And I just want to leave on this one thing. We have to vote, okay? Every two, four, or six years, there are people that we put in place that have our voice, okay? But in their vote, in their halls of justice makes decisions for us. Now, if they don't know us, how can they vote for us? How can they know what we want? How can they know what we need? We have to make sure that we go to them. They all have doors that open and close. We have to go to those doors and make sure that they, we have to walk through it and then dress them and let them know what, where our communities are. Now, if they don't want us in and walking through their doors, we need to not let them have those doors anymore and we need to vote them out. That's our power, okay? So as a community, we have to make sure as a whole that they recognize us as being black, they need to recognize us as a disability, and they need to recognize our allies and our friends. We need to support each other and we need to fight together. And if they don't support us, we can't support them. Vote them out collectively. And we need to create groups that make sure that they know what our voice and what our opinions are. Remember, we a lot of people are applying for unemployment. If they don't support us, they need to be the ones applying for unemployment, okay? That's just the way I feel. And I, again, I just want to thank you all. And we could do this for a whole other hour and a half. But yeah. <laughs> everyone, y'all have a great one. And I hope everybody that um, came in and viewed it, I hope they really enjoyed it. And Take care, everyone. Be safe. We love you all. Vic and the panel for Disability Pride. We all good. And, and y'all have a great night. Good night. Thank Thanks, Kevin. Bye. Bye. Love you. We want to make sure we thank the interpreters. Oh, thank and our interpreters. By, by the way, if, if I can make a quick observation, if I can make just a quick observation.
Go ahead. I'm trying to figure out how Kevin is the only one who's not using a voice, but is the only one sitting there drinking like he's thirsty. Because <laughs> <laughs> he's active. You know how no, no, I'm not mad at him. I'm just, I just thought it was fun. <laughs> oh, man. Well, I'm going to go ahead and take the next I'll let you all go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Take care. Bye, Bye everybody. Bye. 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 Chuck, I'll talk to you later. Okay, kick it. Thanks, man. All right. We're good. Thank you for doing that. That was awesome. Cool. Did you stop? You shut down on everything? Yep. Okay, cool. It went well? Yeah, sorry. Okay, cool, cool, cool. There's a bunch of questions I didn't ask, but hope That's everybody okay. enjoyed it. I think that this was so powerful and so many people joined us that we should do this on a regular. Okay. We can. We can. Okay. But you was you um it went well, people was really Yeah. We oh, had we still live. We still on what? On Facebook? Uh I think Zoom. We still. You're no. not recording anymore. Okay.